Welcome, everybody, and welcome this morning um, to this Renew webinar on 6G. We have a quite full schedule with very interesting speakers who will provide you with their insights in five keynotes on 6G, and each will take five to seven minutes to make it more complicated for you. Afterwards, we will go ahead with a panel discussion. And for that, we welcome your questions. And you can click on the top right button of the web stream page to post a question. Or if you're in the Zoom, you can type them in the chat. But before we start the keynote speakers, uh, let me first give the floor to my colleague uh, who came up with this great idea to organize this webinar, uh, former Finnish minister and currently my colleague in the European Parliament, Mauri Pekarinen. Mauri, the floor is yours. Mauri, I'm afraid you have to unmute yourself. There you go. Yes, maybe, maybe now. It's just me. Thank you so much, Bart. Uh, I would like to, to welcome you all uh, to our webinar on my behalf as well. Dear friends, uh, by now it's clear that digital technologies will shape our economy and society. I would like to take the example of 5G, also 5G. The competition for its deployment is on and it has the potential to shape competition at a global scale. We are fortunate that we host two major network providers in the EU. By the way, at the same time, we also discuss its broader implications, like the security risks that are involved. But 5C is by no means the final stage of technological development. Work for the next generation of technologies, the 6C, the 6C is already uh, underway. In 2018, University of Oulu was the first in the world to set up a 6C research program, partially financed by the Horizon program. Others have followed suit. Although the development of 6C technologies is still in its infancy and focused on research and defining a technological vision, we can already see that there is enormous potential. 6C will not just be a quicker internet con connection. 6C will inevitably change the society and business models. It promises to be a service platform for communities and people, but also for things and devices powered by the, the AI and create entirely new markets. Some have even claimed that it might indicate the birth of a sixth sense prediction of a near future through AI. However, none of this will come without considerable effort. Research needs are still substantial. To lead, we need to be able to shape the competition in our own terms and our own values and be ready to adapt to the changes to come. This means having the right policy framework and taking down regulatory barriers where they exist. All this while we face stiff competition from the US, China and others. Dear participants, the commercial deployment of 6C is now some 10 years away. In climate policy, by the way, we aim to make significant emissions reduction by 2030. In the same way, should we accept the positive challenge that the 6C implies by 2030? What would that mean for European research and its priorities? How can the EU push collaboration between technological research 
and the industry. Have we some of the best experts in Europe to discuss these topics with to us today? It's great privilege for us. We have professors Ari Potu and Paul Smolders from universities of Oulu and Eindhoven and Dr. Walker Siegler from Nokia Bell Labs to tell us the state of play in research and industry. Director General Luis Sorga Romero from ETSI, European Standards Organization, will discuss the ever important topic of uh, technological standards and uh, the Director General Khalid Rohana will deliver commission's point of view. I look forward to a lively discussion and debate. You all are very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mauri Pekarinen, for that great introduction. And I'd like to give the floor to our first speaker. It's Professor Ari Pautu from Finland, and um, he's completely into the wireless. There's one thing that he's very good at, which is for, there's not wireless, it's the guitar playing, Professor Putu. I heard you're a great guitar player as well, a 6G uh, vice director for the flagship, but um, please six proceed, strings, Professor. Six strings, there six you go. Six strings, yeah. So. <laughs> but please um, proceed and tell us. I, I play for my own uh, amusement. Uh, I'm not uh, in, 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 in a professional level yet, but uh, sufficiently good to say that uh, I sometimes entertain others as well. But without further ado, and we only have eight minutes max, preferably a little bit late, but less, I will now show you a few slides and say some words about the 6G uh, 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 in general and uh, flagship uh, in particular. Now, we, Maori already basically said most of the, uh, what is the vision of uh, 2030s? Our society, it will be a data-driven, enabled by near instant, unlimited wireless connectivity. Now, what this actually means is that uh, everything in our society may be a process, service, device, will be connected to the internet through wireless means. And a huge amount of data will appear, which needs to be somehow wisely uh, processed. And this wisdom, if I may use the word, comes from fusing AI into the networks close to the operations where everything is really happening. A couple of words about our 6 tree research program here in Finland. Academy of Finland launched 2017 a competition in Finland to offer flagship uh, research funding for, for, for uh, the best sciences in Finland. Now, the 6 tree proposal was actually the most successful. It was ranked number one in science. It's an eight-year program with an approximately 251 million euro budget. This is uh, partially only coming from uh, uh, Academy of Finland and the university. Most of it comes from competed sources like in Finland, Business Finland, Academy of Finland companies, as well as the European Union. As an example, we have just uh, together with Nokia and Ericsson and others with 25 partners joined this HEXA-X European flagship for 6G research. Obviously coming from Finland, we collaborate with Nokia and local players. We have three major targets in this program. First of all, introduction of 5G to markets via innovative vertical solutions. This means that we try to introduce wireless solutions to factories, health services, energy, transport, you name it. There are a huge amount of these. Second one is to develop the fundamental enablers of 6G. And they, there we have these four research areas, wireless connectivity, where you target one terabit per second data rates and even lower latency and higher reliability for certain applications. Terabit per second is a huge data rate, which mean, means that we need to have a big chunk of spectrum. And this brings us to number two, devices and circuits. We need to go so high in the frequency in order to offer, offer this one therapy capabilities that we need to figure out new semiconductor materials that actually can support and provide uh, 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 efficient 
operation in those uh, frequencies. I already mentioned the AI bringing in all the data in decision-making processes. So we need to bring in the distributed computing near to our processes, devices, and services. And the fact comes from the low latency issue. There's also this privacy issue. And then there is a third issue, which is basically totally new compared to AI and machine learning in previous years. We are now applying it into hugely dynamic processes where you need to be able to come to decision-making within hundreds of milliseconds, which means that the earlier algorithms need to be redeveloped in such a way that they can exist and operate in dynamic environment. Third area is services and applications. Now here we look at disruptive value networks. We already know that the mobile network operators are offering the coverage in national and global level. That needs to be complemented in the future with new type of business models where in different verticals, the requirements are so diverse that we predict an emergence of new players into the market that actually treat the capabilities required in different verticals separately, thus complementing the offerings of mobile network operators. Then if you take just a couple of numbers, we have currently close to 400 experts working in this uh, uh, flagship or have worked. Very international, 40, 58 nationalities, currently 1300 uh, publications and 130 new, no, new company collaborators have joined us. And we have also this 5G test network, which is basically a micro-operated, we are an operator, we do have SIM cards and we micro-operate this SIM. And this is one of the ways to offer services for vertical players as well as the ICT players. If we think about how this world goes about in cellular uh, domain, 1G, 2G voice, right? 3G promised internet our pockets didn't happen, but 4G delivered 20 years. And now we see 5G and 6G as a similar continuum as 3G, 4G and 1G and 2G, so that the real applications of internet of things will start with 5G and emerge in huge numbers, in trillions in 6G era. Now, there are several critical drivers towards 6G. One is the society and the sustainability of the future solutions. For instance, we can claim that most of the 17 United Nations SDGs in direct or indirect fashion will benefit from wireless connectivity, connecting every person in the planet into the internet providing information most of the cases in the UN SDGs. There is ever increasing need in business domain for uh, new verticals coming into the play, disrupting current business models, but also the productivity challenge. We need to be able to provide higher productivity for our industries. Security becomes even bigger problem with 6G. Now we already know in 5G that the, the threat vectors exploded, the number of them. And now we start to see new players entering the market. We already know that mobile network operators are by law <laughs> required to be dependable players. But now when we start to see these new verticals appearing, we have to be also very wary and know how to play in the market in the future so that it's private and it's secure. I already talked about these radio technologies and AIs and we'll uh, skip those. And I know there will be a lot of talk about standards. The only message here is global standard is a necessity. Anyway, where we start to look at regional standards, it's always hindrance. Here we have the 6G playground. We have the sustainability issues, we have business issues, and we have technology issues. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see 12 white papers published with the help of 250 experts globally with coming experts from 100 organizations. And here you can see the address, 6gchannel.com slash 6 g white papers. Here we deal with the sustainability, business issues, technology issues, part by part. So the real answers and the real technology enablers can be found 
within these documentations. I hope I made it in eight minutes. Thank you very eight much. Minutes, eight minutes and nine seconds, uh, Professor Pau Tu. It was impressive. And uh, thank you very much for this uh, great introduction. And we'll be speaking uh, later on uh, with you uh, with questions from the panel. And I'd like to um, give the floor to Professor Bart Smolders. He's from the Netherlands, prof the University of Eindhoven. And he's worked uh, on 5G and beyond also on 6G with Philips, with NXP and with Ericsson. And um, he's a well-renowned expert here. And I'd like to give you the floor, Professor Bart Smolders. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Bart, uh, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so my talk will, uh, will be quite complementary to uh, the previous talk. So I will focus on 6G technology development in Europe, and I will take a research perspective. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm myself, I'm active in the research on smart antennas for 5G and 6G, and I'm leading uh, several European and national projects uh, in this area as well. Now, Europe has, you know, from the start of mobile communication has had a strong position in wireless innovations, and we still are doing uh, a good job there, uh, but there are some weaknesses that we need to address, and I will touch upon that. Um, and in my talk, I will focus on the what's known as the key enabling technologies. And a similar story could be told about software, for example, about artificial intelligence, which was already mentioned. Um, so the content of my talk is first to, tr to talk about a few trends in wireless communication, um, which result in a need for more capacity. And I'll then touch upon the key enabling technologies and the European position there and opportunities for, for Europe. Now, the first trend is shown here in this plot. Uh, if we you know, uh, look at the past 120 years, we've seen new wireless uh, applications popping up. And what you see in this, uh, in this plot, that is almost, well, it's a logarithmic plot, but it's a linear curve. And we move towards using higher frequencies. Um, and, and new applications are 5G and, for example, also car radar, uh, which is operated at uh, around 80 gigahertz. And now the reason to move to higher frequencies, of course, is that while well, the lower frequencies are simply occupied, so we need to move to higher frequencies because we have new applications, but we also need more bandwidth. Now, this bandwidth um, requirement was already, um, um, you know, explored quite nicely by uh, Ed Holm. Uh, so in a paper in 2004, he made an estimation of the uh, increase in data rate for wireless communication. And data rate is is one-to-one uh, -one related to bandwidth. And what he observed in Ed Holm's law is that the data rate seems to double each 18 months. So that's similar to Moore's law that you might know of. And uh, it's pretty accurate. And I will show that, uh, uh, that, that it's also accurate when we move to from 5G to 6G. Uh, now, this trend, if you, you know, take a look, a look at the evolution of wireless standards, moving from 1G to 6G, uh, well, in 1 and 2G, 2G is also known as GSM, uh, you know, we were primarily focused on voice, uh, but in 3G and especially in 4G, we moved to data uh, transport and, and uh, you know, through mobile broadband. Uh, and if you, if you uh, map Atom's, Atom's law from, you know, going from 4G to 5G, then you see that we increase the data rate with a factor of 100 for moving from 100 megabit per second to 10 gigabit per second in 10 years. And that's really a factor of, well, approximately 100. And that's in line with what at home, you know, uh, um, already predicted. And when we move from 5G to 6G, we move again with a factor of 100 in, in 10 years. Now, now, what does this mean? Well, it means that the data rate increases and the capacity, which is the data rate times the number of users, as you can imagine, then increases even more. And uh, we can only, you know, uh, serve the increase in capacity need by moving to higher frequencies. And when moving to higher frequencies, we need to use smart antennas. And what a smart antenna is, I will, I will show in, in a second. But it means that it will enable an exponential growth of semiconductor content. And it also means that the intelligence moves partly from the central office towards the antenna. 
which is also an important point. Next to smart antennas, we also need towards 6G more computing power and we need more network communication. And if you um, map that to technologies, it means that we need more complex digital chips, you know, integrated circuits. And that requires advanced silicon CMOS processes, what's known as Moore's law. But it also requires technologies that are known as more than more. So for example, integrated photonics is very important and quantum computing. Now, well, my own uh, field of expertise is smart antenna. So of course I want to show you uh, a few uh, nice photographs of that. Uh, well, this picture shows one of the prototypes that we developed already five years ago um, with European industry uh, partners. And this shows a smart antenna. Um, and what you can see is that you not only have one antenna, but it's a kind of array of antennas. So each small dot here, um, a square is an antenna. And together, these, uh, this, uh, this antenna forms a smart antenna. And the interesting thing about the smart antenna is on the backside. So this is a photo of the backside of this smart antenna. And it shows that each small antenna element is connected to a silicon integrated circuit, also known as a chip. And you can already see from this photo, this prototype, that the smart antennas requires a huge amount of chips, which is an interesting opportunity from a technology point of view. Now, uh, going back to the key enabling technologies for 6G and what is now the European position here, well, first, the advanced silicon CMOS that we needed for this complex digital chips. What you see at this moment is that the European semiconductor companies, they use a more or less fabless model. So they design digital complex chips, but the manufacturing is done externally and mainly by TSMC in Taiwan, which, uh, you know, in his, from a historic point of view originated or was founded by, by Philips, as you might know. Um, well, there you could say Europe has a kind of weak position. The market share is low and we rely on external partners. In uh, manufacturing equipment, so the, the, the equipment that is needed by TSMC to manufacture such a CMOS chip, we're doing a good job. So for example, our superstar ASML. In specialized semiconductor technologies, like by CMOS and 3.5 technologies, gallium marcenite, for example, Europe, Europe has a good position. Uh, primarily for analog and high frequency applications. And that's important for 6G as well. Now in more emerging technologies like photonics and quantum, uh, we have a, a very good position from an academic point of view. Uh, but in order to scale up from an industrial, you know, with real industrial products and have economical benefit, we really need to have a strong long-term strategy. It's not going to happen by itself. Now, what are the opportunities for Europe towards 6G? Um, let us use the strong position in telecommunication. We have two fantastic uh, system integrators there, uh, Ericsson and Nokia. So we have a very good position. Uh, in automotive, we are very strong, not only the car manufacturers, but also the semicon uh, companies like NXP, Infineon and ST. They, are, uh, they have a market share worldwide of 30% in uh, semiconductor components for, uh, for this industry. And note that in 6G, um, 6G will play a very important role to enable autonomous driving. Now that's an opportunity. And furthermore, we are strong in what I already mentioned, specialized semiconductor components. Now, what we need to do, from my point of view, we should uh, try to build complete ecosystems and complete value chains, you know, to maximize the economical benefit for Europe. So we should scale up emerging special technologies and uh, not only on a research level, but also going towards innovation and products. And we should consider also an EU-based manufacturing of advanced CMOS. Now, what I would like to uh, propose also is to define a joint EU living lab. In Dutch, we call it Proeftuin. And uh, already in, in, in Finland, they are taking nice initiative, but I think we really need to scale this up to a European level. So we need one or two places or maybe more places in Europe where technology meets applications. Having said that, I hope I'm within the eight minutes. Thanks for your attention.
Well, it was a, 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 about a minute over time, Bart, but it was so interesting. I dare not interrupt you. So thank you very much for this great introduction. Um, we will meet again later with the questions and we will proceed now to Dr. Volker Ziegler, who will be joining us from Munich, Germany. And he is, has recently, uh, have, he's been a head of the 5G development at Nokia Bell Labs, one of the most famous labs in the world. And now, currently, he is a, a 6G leadership uh, role in Nokia Bell Labs. And we're very delighted to have such a prominent figure like you, Dr. Ziegler. And I'd like to give you the floor and please uh, proceed. Yeah, thank you very much, Bart. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the time to be bold and visionary. This is uh, the moment in time to really uh, define a vision for the 2030s, communications in the 2030s. And uh, going back to your opening, keynote, Maori, uh, Becker, and I agree with you, it's all about value we create and we have the opportunity to create for society and mankind in Europe and worldwide. And of course, tying into opportunity for growth and uh, new business impact as well in a very powerful fashion. So let me get started by briefly uh, reflecting on what our vision at Nokia, Nokia Bell Labs is for the 6G era. And indeed, 6G is on. Let me, let me share this with all of you in case you're not aware. Uh, two years ago, we started to engage on 6G research. At the same time, to be clear, 5G, we've only started the journey, right? There's eight or more years still of evolution coming, but now is the time to at the same time really frame 6G uh, research. And we at Nokia, Nokia Bell Labs start from a bold vision, which is about connecting the worlds, connecting the physical world, the digital world, and the biological world, right? And when we say biological world, this of course means how do we smartly interface as humans with the new uh, networks and paradigm coming up. And what you see in the middle of this circle then are the use case clusters, applications that you could potentially associate with a vision for the 6G era in terms of use case buckets and broadly clustered into topics of augmenting our human intelligence, creating and consuming new digital worlds, very exciting. And last but not least, new ways, no ways of really, if you like, controlling the automators, right? And so maybe just to add a little bit of more color to this, and we can briefly come back to this in just a moment, but augmenting our intelligence is a very powerful theme and a lot of value in this also for a society and mankind. Why? Because this will be about, if you like, creating like a sixth sense, as we say at Bell Labs. It's a sixth sense in the, in, in, by means of uh, truly creating a permanent augmented reality overlay so as to enhance uh, the way we work with and learn from machines, the way we sense and analyze the world around us, but also the human body, right? Think of in-body networks, a lot of uh, cool opportunity in the medical domain. The other big area, big bucket of use cases, creating, consuming new digital worlds. Well, one cool example would be actually a session like this. This is not bad. I mean, we see each other, we can share a screen, but you know, in the thirties, well, one, I hope we are post pandemic, but then hopefully we'll have ways to truly uh, immerse in a holographic kind of telepresence environment. And um, the other key bucket of use cases probably would be about uh, controlling the automatons. And that's another powerful theme, not just in terms of um, remote driving scenarios, taking drone and robot swarm control to the next level, but maybe also in terms of like think of the elderly, making sure that they can stay at home longer in their preferred um, home environment and at ease thanks to domestic robots powered up by, by 6G. And all this is happening now powered up by broad themes of technology, revolution and evolution, probably clustered into four domains, namely ubiquitous compute. So this ties into heterogeneous uh, cloud compute environment. But at the same time, by the way, devices will take new form factors. It ties into new exciting technologies on sensing and actuation. actuation. And to say this up front, one of the most uh, exciting dimensions of 6G really is that we will we have the ambition to design networks, not just for communication purposes, but for also for sensing purposes at the same time. 
knowledge systems. That's another very uh, prominent technology theme that we would wish to explore more as part of the research effort as we have now started. So this ties into artificial intelligence, uh, data information architecture at large. And last but not least, of course, it's all about human machine interface and the way we interact smartly uh, with the machines and thereby em empower new use cases. And as mentioned, obviously one of the examples that, that um, is, is very uh, prominent at this time, it motivates definitely me and many of our colleagues is, is about mixed reality telepresence, right? It's about uh, how do we optimize, really optimize the architecture for streams how do we move towards concepts such as spatial compute, which by the way, ties into the way we interact with machines by, by human gesture. And of course, all kinds of interesting challenges that go beyond what 5G can do, opportunities uh, in terms of research, how do we synchronize, how do you provide the bandwidth, uh, hundreds of gigabit per second, so as to make all this happen. Another great example, and since I'm based here out of uh, Southern Germany, and I know it's true in many parts of Europe, we have a very strong industrial base, so I think the 6G will be game changing, truly opening up new opportunity in terms of the way we design products across industries and across sectors, all the way from agriculture to pharmaceutical. Um, so this includes a variety of cool scenarios of remote collaboration, high resolution precision sensing and actuation. And of course it implies redefining some of the value chains as well. And with this, let's have since I'm Galax, I need to share just briefly, if you allow some aspects of technology, six key technologies as we associate uh, as being key for 6G, the new era coming up. And these are the areas where we uh, have started to engage uh, actively and also jointly with a variety of partners. I'll come back to this, distinct partners in academia, but also partners from industry and uh, small and medium enterprise, um, and not just telco sector, but way beyond. But the six key technologies, just to describe them briefly to you, one is truly pervasive leverage of AI ML and all the way to the AI interface. So some of you would say, yeah, part of this we all do with 5G, right? Point solutions, so we can optimize beam forms, packet scheduling by means of AI. But our vision here, it's in the meantime more than the vision, conceptual work is really to come up with a flexible framework for the AI interface. There's this whole topic theme of new spectrum technologies. So going up in frequency beyond 100 gigahertz. And I can tell you, we are now out of Bell Labs working on the first prototypes, transceiver units at 140 gigahertz. Real cool stuff, why? Because these are the technologies that will allow you to, in specialized network sec settings, let's be clear, not, not, not nationwide, but in specialized settings, you can do like up to uh, a terabit per second kind of throughput. Network as a sensor, as already mentioned, this is another key dimension, revolutionary one of the research ambition for 6G. A lot of architectural uh, change also coming, opportunity to simplify networks. Uh, the fifth big theme is of, of course about extreme connectivity. So pushing the, the limits even further in terms of latency as well as reliability. So here around the corner in Stuttgart, we have teams working on control loops in the range of 100, and 100 microseconds. So this is clearly sub one millisecond range. And yes, very important and not as, as an afterthought, it's all about security and trust. And with this last uh, maybe quick reflection, just uh, also on, on Nokia and, uh, and our European position as, as being a, a, uh, uh, a, Nokia, a uh, European headquartered Finland based company. And we are really uh, happy about that. Why? Because we have very favorable uh, support environment here from from the uh, European Commission, it's great to hear that the legislative proposal for a strategic European partnership on smart network and services has been accepted. But this is to share with you an ongoing project, which we just started in case you're not aware, a couple of months back under Nokia leadership and jointly with a variety of partners, actually Ari, University of Ulu is one of them. Um, and uh, this is clearly done in the joint spirit of what has made Europe strong with previous cheese, and it's a wonderful platform now into, into the 6G era, framing jointly with a partner, uh, a whole range of partners out of a consortium, framing the research initiative for Europe. And uh, what you can see, this is the ambition to be a stepping stone into SNS, into smart networks and services, into Horizon Europe, and the key technology enablers as we now, in a pre-competitive fashion, even prior to dissemination and standardization, for the next 
uh, two years or so, we will jointly explore really ties into the big themes as previously already discussed, namely new radio access technologies, connected intelligence, as well as architectural enablers for network disaggregation. And so we really look forward to this opportunity to jointly frame what the next uh, G should be so as to help unlock the full potential uh, and out of Europe uh, with worldwide relevance and impact. And with this, back over to you, Bart. Thank you, Volker Ziegler. This was a great, great, great talk. And thank you very much for hanging in uh, with us. Um, so we've seen different technologies. We've seen academia now. Um, later, the European Commission will come as well and reflect on 6G developments. But first, we will go to uh, Luis Jorge Romero, and he is Director General for Etsy. And Etsy is very important in standard setting. We see different technologies coming together. How will they interoperate and who will set these standards? And so the floor is yours, Luis Jorge. And I, you're connecting uh, to us from Nice, I believe. And I, the temperature difference between um, Maori and Ari and you is about 25 or 30 degrees, but I hope you, <laughs> <laughs> you keep your head cool. Thank you, the floor is yours. I'm trying to, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much actually for inviting us to be part of this very interesting uh, summit or very interesting conference. Because indeed, uh, as all the speakers before me have been saying, uh, we are there already with 6G and, and uh, Europe has, has uh, historically played a very important role in the development of the different technologies starting in 2G. And, and I think we have an excellent opportunity of keep on doing that. And I will try to explain what is the role that we are playing in the middle as a standard setting organization. Um, the first thing that I would like to, to point out is, of course, uh, and we've heard it already, uh, people are already engaged in 6G, despite the fact that we are seeing the new 5G technology being deployed and spread all across. Uh, of course, we have to, to start thinking of, of what's coming next. Uh, we have more or less uh, understood and seen how technologies have evolved almost in a 10 years cycle even though if we look a little bit at 5G, we will see that even this cycle is starting to be compressed a little bit. So let, let's see if next time is 10 years or we are even closer to that. When we look at 6G, and I think we have um, some of these uh, words will resonate. Uh, we, have, we have heard of more speed. I mean, if, if we compare it to, to what we have in 5G, uh, uh, we, we, we are hearing about more speed, more capacity, more reliability, less latency. So it's basically basic characteristics that we were pointing at in, in 5G. Uh, we will have it better. But then something which has been very important and, and several speakers have pointed at, it's way more flexibility that will be probably uh, and basically enabled by the uh, upcoming artificial intelligence that will grow over the years. And furthermore, there are a couple of topics and subjects that were also important in 5G, but will be paramount in 6G, uh, the way it's, it's evolving. First is all about energy efficiency. We need to give much more with much less. And, and this is something that's fundamental. And then um, the quest for security. And we have heard about the relevance of quantum computing and, and all that goes around it. So, so really, really important how we are moving forward. And for that, uh, we need to understand that it's not an easy path. Uh, from the great ideas uh, to market, and that's, that's what we are uh, looking at, uh, there is a big food chain that we need to nurture and that, that is there. I've tried to simplify it enormously because as you may imagine, this is way more complex and, and many more ties uh, get into this chain. But basically we've, we've been hearing, hearing a lot about R&D. Let me for once uh, put the standards in the middle of the picture. So uh, we have standards and then we have uh, simplified it a lot deployment, but it, this includes uh, manufacturing, uh, putting in place, deploying, uh, marketing and all this stuff that, that goes uh, at the end of the chain before we get this wide adoption in the marketplace. For that, not every uh, uh, 
place has the same needs, even though, uh, of course, everybody is engaged in most of the change in, in, in this, uh, or in, in this uh, big uh, uh, chain. If I could go uh, very, very quickly to uh, what could be needed. First of all, we see that, of course, uh, great ideas usually come with education and with, with knowledge. I think, I think this is something where, where we as Europeans are, are really, really high. And we need to keep on doing that. And, and we have heard today how this has been fed into the uh, many uh, R&D projects that we need to, to keep on uh, pursuing and, and helping. This research is uh, really taking up uh, or taking off here in Europe. And we need to keep on uh, stressing the need for that. We will need lots of resources, lots of investment behind and facilitating networking because now it's not a single place where all research will take place. We need, we need uh, and we have experienced this with, with years. Uh, on standards, we need uh, openness, due process, transparency to make them happen. Openness is really key, and I will come to this in a minute. And um, then we need to uh, create the right environment and the, the right background to enable de deployment. Here, again, we will need lots of investment, but then we will need to create the proper uh, field so that uh, our crops grow in the right manner. We need to, to uh, uh, get the right uh, uh, conditions, the right regulation, because regulation can be very beneficial to the growth of, uh, of 6G, to the growth of new technologies. And therefore, um, we need to see how everything fits together in a nice place. And all of that needs lots of coordination, lots of uh, work together. And uh, here we, uh, I, I would like to stress why standards have a great strategic value. First of all, because it's the place where we bring people together to work and cooperate so that all the pieces are able to interoperate to, uh, to be put together, regardless of where those are de developed. So kind of the edges fit which, with each other. And here's where we can already put the enablers and ensure that the right me mechanisms are in place in order for us to keep on stressing the values that we want to, to pass along. For that, we need global and broad participation. It's a great opportunity to have our values being spread across the whole world. It's very easy uh, when we are working at, at, at the same peer level to uh, kind of influence and, and pass along what we want and then have it embedded into our standards so that it can be de further deployed everywhere over the world. So bringing every people to, together and having all people uh, cooperating is of a key importance. And that's the way in which uh, Europe is very well placed, because as I said, uh, it's been for many years uh, spearheading the, the uh, evolution of the different Gs. Uh, we have very strong uh, manufacturing, we have very strong vendors, we have very, very strong industry, and we have very strong uh, academia and research and development. So we, we need to put all this together and, and try and, and uh, with that uh, act as a great and very strong uh, sports machine, if I may call it this way. I think with that, I would just like to, to highlight why standards are important, why contribution and participation on a peer level uh, based on trust and with working conditions is fundamental. Uh, and I, I believe uh, Europe is in the, in the right place and in the right pace to try and keep on leading uh, in the development of the different G's. So thank you.
Great. So again, thank you, uh, Director General Romero. It was a great um, uh, highlighting the essence of global standards, but with the correct values in it. It's very important also for our political group. Um, having said all this, I'd like to give the floor to the European Commission and on a reflection on what has been said. And I'm very honored to have in our midst uh, Khalil Rouhana. And Khalil Rouhana has an extensive and impressive career within the European Commission. But to our listeners, I'd also like to mention that he actually has been, uh, he has founded his own company as well. So he's been in the, um, in the business as well. And I'd like to give you the floor to you, Deputy Director General from DG Connects, one of the most important DGs we have in the Commission, Khalil Rohana. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bart. And it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, uh, listen to, uh, I'd say, impressive, really, presentations uh, on uh, the future of our network infrastructure. And I would say not only our network, but our, our whole digital infrastructure. Uh, the uh, really uh, uh, most of the, I mean, all the presentations were along the same lines, and I, I would adhere to 100% uh, of what was said in terms of the opportunities ahead of us. Uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the opportunities in terms of applications that would come uh, uh, through 5G and 6G, but also the opportunities of technology development that will enable us to deploy these applications. I think the, uh, from, the, from the Commission side, uh, we, we, you know, our support to the development of our uh, telecom and compute infrastructure and now our data infrastructure is, uh, has been always uh, high and will remain very, very high, as you know. I mean, the, the, there's no uh, doubt about it. Uh, the, we see this transition from 5G to 6G essential. Uh, my commissioner repeats this, that it's one of the key priorities for the union to maintain our leadership in uh, the whole field of uh, communication, but also to build on it to reinforce our presence in the rest of the digital infrastructure, compute and data. And we can do that. And I think uh, the 5G already, but 6G gives us this opportunity because the presentations as we see them are about further integration of this infrastructure as we see it. And uh, that goes from what we call the, you know, the, the far edge computing, which is the embedded systems and the development around the internet of things to the, uh, the edge computing of the future with all these uh, infrastructure and the need to be deployed at vertical sectors, including network and compute to what, you know, connect all this, which is the whole networking infrastructure. The, we, the, this is a key priority for us. And uh, where the investments that we announced are um, uh, hope uh, in line with the expectations. If we want to move to, to maintain a leadership. And I say I maintain because I hear a lot that, you know, we're nowhere in 5G. We're still world leaders and we are among the world leaders and if not world leader in the telecom equipment uh, infrastructure and that will continue. We have our two flagship industries but a whole supply chain behind it as well. If we wanna maintain that leadership, we have to do as we did before, be first movers. Be first movers in supporting research and development but at the same time, and here I, I disagree a bit with Lewis, the, this diagram is not so linear. You should know, I mean, it's not only, you know, do R&D and then deploy, et cetera. We saw that if we want to be accelerating innovation, we have to do things in parallel and have these loops between first deployments, bring the users up front as well in your development. So we have to be first movers in R&D. We have to be first movers in the rollout of the infrastructure. We have to be first movers in adopting the technology and we have to be first movers also in standard setting. And uh, being first is not sufficient. You have to be also the best if you want to be competitive worldwide. And this is what we've been able to do so far. And I know that we have uh, indeed weaknesses and uh, Professor Smolders highlighted them. I totally agree with him uh, that we need to uh, 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 absolutely address. But uh, so far, you know, when we were first movers, when we were able to mobilize all our stakeholders, when we were able to put critical mass of investments and associate the work that we do on the technology development 
with the work that we do on adapting our legal framework, where the work that we do on the rollout of technology with the public sector being a first mover as well, key, a key in their strategy. And when we were able to make sure that our industry has the right framework and that we defend it worldwide to make sure that we have level playing fields worldwide and that we have reciprocity in terms of openness of our market, there we succeed. And this is our, this is our line. This is our line. On R&D, we have just announced the joint undertaking, and really many thanks for all the stakeholders here for uh, SNS. It will be close to a billion euro of investment from the, from the EU, but we expect that industry will bring in the three or four or five times more as we did in the current PPP on 5G. We, uh, with that, we hope also that member states will complement this investment using the national funds, but also using now the recovery plan. I come back to it very well. That that's, we think is a very good framing uh, initiative like we did before working collectively to be the best and to be the first movers. And at the same time, we, we launched and the XIX is one of the projects, as you know, so we were first movers to engage in R&D and, and I think Volker explained and, and uh, Professor Fogel uh, uh, explained how important that is. The, the, this first investment that we've done, so it will be continuity, R&D. But we're also um, you know, engaged now with the stakeholders, with the member states to ensure the full rollout of 5G. We need the rollout of 5G if we want to move to 6G. And we cannot be just you know, lagging behind or whatever. We have some catch up to do, but the plan are, you know, the, we have serious commitment to engage in it. So ensuring the full rollout of 5G, and, and I agree that the move to 6G, based on what we learned from 5G, we need to, to bring in the vertical users. We need to bring them in upfront as well to ensure that we have a, 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 a quick uh, move from the R&D, from the technology development to the applications. So that's you know, also work in progress. And I hope that the, we will have these verticals also as part of our joint undertaking and SNS. We need also to, to make sure that we uh, invest in the rest of the supply chain. And I totally agree with the, the fact that uh, our dependence is increasing now. Our dependence is increasing because of the sophistication and complexity that will come from the next generation network. And this convergence between networking uh, uh, the, and computing, the softwareization of uh, the network infrastructure, including on RANs, we need to make sure that we have enough in Europe, enough development, enough production in Europe that would enable us to be part of the world trade in this area. And that's essential for us. This is why we announced also a big initiative on semiconductor based on what we've done already in the first IPCI. So the first industrial project of European interest is in microelectronics, was in microelectronics. We saw it, it's delivering now. 8 billion euro of investment. And now we're moving into the next step and we're pushing and we're working together with the member states and with industry, what could be a next big investment that could come in semiconductor. It could cover all the points that Bart mentioned, all the points regarding RF, next generation RF components, quantum computing, edge, AI, but also CMOS and more than more. We want to have a big initiative. Our focus so far was more than more. We see Europe is very strong indeed, as you mentioned. We want to make sure that we come back to CMOS with manufacturing capacities in Europe. That's really what we, we think is important. We need to come back to that. And we think at an investment to close to 30, 40 billion euros will be needed for that. This is why we're putting the, that type of projects as a, as a priority that we, for the recovery plans where we would have 135 billion euros to invest on, uh, on uh, uh, digital. So we want to come back to semiconductor. We want also to make sure that we have the complete compute chain also in Europe. We started with high forms computing where we saw the importance of getting our act together. And now we want to expand. We want to be present in these areas that are critical for our economy. And really the standardization is essential. I think the standardization should accompany the development as Louis said and we will continue supporting this. And finally, frankly, the, this 135 billion of the recovery plan could be an, an exceptional opportunity for the EU 
to be a first mover in rolling out the application of 5G and preparing for 6G. And that's extremely important. And we saw it coming now, we see it coming from the recovery plans of the member states. There's a lot of work on the digital transformation of our health sector, the digital transformation of our mobility se sector, transport, uh, the, uh, so smart cities, that's very important. And it's encouraging, but we encourage the member states to use latest technology and to make sure that they support the development of an industrial ecosystem in Europe. That's the, the way we see the future. Uh, and the, the, you know, we're preparing with it, with the, with the current investments and future investments. Uh, our, we, we announced a, a flagship on quantum. We've announced a big uh, a project on quantum communication infrastructure. Totally agree that this would be a game changer in terms of security of network. And we're working with industry to make sure that we have the lowest power consumption components, the lowest power consumption in this uh, equipment uh, for the future. This is an area where Europe is strong and will continue to be strong. Our support to this field was really uh, high and as high uh, as it can be. Thank you, Deputy Director General Rohana. This was a great uh, reflection on what we've heard. Um, and now I'd like to proceed to some of the questions that have been asked by people watching and by some of the questions that people have um, uh, re reflecting on what you have said. It was very interesting. Um, I'd like to have a lively discussion, so short answers, short questions, if it's possible, so we can touch on many subjects. And let me start by the first question that came in here. It's about, let me start in the United States. We'll uh, touch on China later, but let me first on start in the United States. There already is a buildup build of technological alliances to take leadership in 6G. Should Europe aim to build something similar? And what do we need to accomplish such private public collaboration on 6G? Um, Volker Ziegler, can I give you the floor? Yes, with pleasure. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, first of all, it's a great question, but to be direct, I think being in Europe at this time, we are starting from the pole position. So I'm not sure why there's an impression as if the United States, and I, we can say this, we are engaged as a European player also in the United States, but the United States do not have the strengths Europe has in terms of private public partnership, in terms of framing vehicles for joint non-competitive, pre-competitive uh, research and collaboration. And uh, I think now is the time part to really make this early joint engagement out of HexaX and then now moving into SNS, make this successful in terms of going beyond research and including, by the way, vehicles of dissemination such as standardization and of course commercialization. And last but not least, Maybe one more aspect here where I think in Europe we have a good starting point and we need to now move swiftly to really exploit this and develop this even more, which is looking at complementary innovation across sectors, right? So 6G very clearly, it's not just ICT anymore. It's not just information communications per se, but it's truly enabling industries and sectors and society at large. And so summarizing, we are starting from the pole position, at least that's my view at this time. Let's make sure we build on that. Um, at the same time, though, keep working with partners in the United States, of course, but with the ambition to lead out of Europe. Thank you very much. And that brings me back to one of the um, ideas that Professor Bart Smolders has raised. And he's, he's, Bart, you talked about a 6G living lab, I noted. Um, could you elaborate on that? Does that is that something that, that, that would reflect the, the public-private partnerships that, that, that in the previous question was asked? And uh, I'd like to have uh, Khalil Rohana uh, to, 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 uh, to, to hear what the Commission thinks of this idea and reflect on that. But first, the floor is yours, uh, Bart. Yeah, I, well, what, what I, I think, uh, you know, um, within Europe, we, we have, of course, all kind of um, European projects eh, where uh, people or our companies team up with academia and et cetera, et cetera. But um, what, what I, I think we really miss um, on the European scale is really, you know, places where, where all these technologies that we have, eh, these great technologies that we have, um, meet, let's say, um, you know, uh, also potential applications. And it was al already mentioned huh, that, that uh, we are lagging behind there as well. Huh? 
Um, and and uh, I think, you know, in, in Europe, we have an, a unique opportunity and, and of unique competences to, to set up such a, what we call in Dutch, a proof town, eh? a, a living lab, maybe that's not the, the perfect word for it, but really physical places where, you know, where, where we bring things together and when you also start, you know, the Netflix of the future can maybe start uh, uh, the business from. That's great. And I'd like to hear the European Commission there reflecting on this. Uh, a new European Netflix starting <laughs> from a 6G living lab. <laughs> Excellent. That would be great a, idea, right? Yeah. A great idea. I, I think uh, I totally agree. First, on the partnership, uh, you know, where uh, I agree with what Volker said, they, where uh, Europe has a good, good tradition of working in partnership in, uh, that we did in 5G. We have a, a huge partnership also that, that we had on uh, microelectronics and embedded systems, new partnership on high performance computing. And that work really saves us. And I say saves the, uh, the, the relatively less investments that we have put, including from the public side so far on the, the, the key technology, digital technologies in general. And uh, I think if we have not had these partnerships, we would be in a, a worse situation. But this uh, compensates a bit. That's why I think these new investments now are essential. Finally, I think we have the means to do it. Let's do it. But partnership has been very, very important for us so far. And I think the, the partnership have to include more now the user. I, I agree, uh, absolutely. We have under the, digital, the new Digital Europe program proposed to have testing and experimentation facilities that brings all key technologies together in different areas and health, uh, to use artificial intelligence, data, latest 5G and networking technologies, and uh, uh, in different areas, as I said, health, mobility, smart cities, agriculture, uh, uh, security, safety. These are, I think, very important parts of Digital Euro program will be close to 1 billion to 1.2 billion euros to be spent on this in the next seven years, starting now in 2021. We have also uh, prioritized or proposed to prioritize the uh, deployment uh, of the 5G corridors, you know, that we, we use also to test 5G with the current pilots that we have. We have 65 million euro pilots on the deployment of 5G using new applications uh, in uh, transport with the cross-border corridors, taking this as a major driver uh, initiative, and I agree with what was said on this. We, we propose to put uh, very important investments to maintain this and to scale it up, to scale up these, uh, I mean, they could be living labs of uh, uh, applications around the cross-border 5G corridors uh, that, uh, that, that could be, that will be deployed uh, in the future. So big supportive of this idea to bring the users up front and accelerate this innovation uh, process as we're doing in testing and experimentation facilities on the Digital Europe program, as we propose to do on the, the Connecting Europe facility as well, with a big investment in this area. Great. So the ambition is here. I, I like it. So thank you very much for that reflection. There's a, there's a question from the audience I'd like to ask to may uh, I, Professor. May I have a one comment on this living lab? Sure. Thing. And the next question is for you too. Yes. Okay, um, I would just wanted to, to, to tell you something that there is this European instrument, this ESFRI, which is looking at research infrastructures in Europe. And uh, to get, there are now a, a proposal put into the ESFRI machinery where we try to connect the 5G, 6G, next generation internet facilities in Europe into one what we call slices a research infrastructure and this proposal is now under evaluation we managed to get it through the phase one and now we have a panel discussion some upcoming we have some more than 10 countries involved and uh, also the ict 17 european trial sites are involved and then a lot of other places are involved. There are like 40, more than 40 partners currently, uh, legal organizations. So this may be one step towards this uh, 6G or, or ICT living lab in more generic terms, uh, if uh, this uh, uh, proposal will be accepted to the S3 uh, roadmap. Just 
wanted to give a piece of information. Great. The, the, the next question is for you as well, Professor Pautu. But we could refer, does anyone want to reflect on what you've previously said? Then the question from um, Alexis, let me just see. Um, could you comment on the role of optical wireless communication, so those are frequencies beyond the terahertz uh, bands, and on satellite communication for, for global coverage on 6G? What is the essence of that? Well, the optical networks are becoming, every, after every generation, the optical networks become more and more important. Since the links in the wireless domain, you want to keep them short, and therefore you aggregate all the traffic into the wireless optical networks or optical networks. And this basically makes the optical industry very important in terms of providing the trunk capacity for all the traffic that will come from the wireless devices of the future. I mean, there may be trillions of them uh, connected to uh, uh, internet. Obviously, we want to also find solutions that the, the information that goes in the internet doesn't travel necessarily to places where it doesn't need to go. 90% of the uh, uh, traffic is local, but cu currently we do not deal it in that fashion. The second question uh, was, could you repeat it? Well, on satellite communications. Okay, global yes, coverage. global cover coverage. Um, the, the one thing that uh, is problematic with uh, uh, the satellite communications, obviously, is the coverage Coverage is a good thing. The problem is the capacity. However, if we want to provide global coverage, and this is one of the ways to do it, it certainly has its place. Also, solutions for local networking solutions so that the communities can be connected and then fed in with newest information every now and then, that kind of solutions also would support the idea of having some kind of, uh, let's say, backhauling through satellite, bringing in the latest information, and then the local network is running in, in the meantime as it can. But uh, the importance in terms of uh, the customers is not going to be extremely huge, but if we talk about global coverage, it's definitely a tool to, to use. Thank you. Anyone else on this subject? Well, maybe I, I would like to comment uh, on on the question because I, I it might be that the uh, the uh, the question was also about free free space optical communication. So it's not only communication through fibers, uh, let's say wired, but also a free space optical communication is an emerging technology. Yeah, and but but for both we we you know we have a, a quite unique position in Europe because we 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 have done uh, you know decades of research on integrated photonics which is a kind of new electronic semiconductor technology which is in an early stage you know that 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 will that could become as big as uh, as CMOS in the future and uh, on an academic level academic level we we have a very strong position uh, both in silicon optics, but also in, uh, for example, Indian phosphide, which is not a technology. And, you know, I think also for that, we really need to have a kind of, I already said that, a strong European strategy, you know, how to bring that further and how to, to provide an economical benefit uh, of it. Thank you. Luis, you have your hand up, please. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to, to add on the satellite bit because satellite component will be important already in 5G, uh, basically to reach out to those um, geographies where infrastructure is not well deployed. And, and this is definitely a, a, a very good way of, of bridging the, the digital gap for, for all, all, these, all these places. So, so I, I still believe satellite will be, will be an important component also in, in 6G. Thanks. Volker, you uh, raised your hand. Did yes, I see that correctly? Maybe to build on what I heard Bart say, maybe in a, in a different dimension, namely, the I think the opportunity with the, for the 30, 60 era also will be about integrating, smartly automating across technology domains. Right? And I'm saying this, like, especially in conjunction with automation, applying IIML and orchestration. And therefore, Kalina, going back to your point, 
finding new ways of really looping users in and industries in, putting them to the driver's seat. And by the way, when you think of security, privacy, and trust, that's the other key domain where simple, similar logic would apply. How do we make sure users are in control in the right way and across, across the actual domain, including access, transport, and the uh, softwareized parts of the stack that kind of cut increasingly across. Maybe just one thing I didn't highlight before, but just to state the obvious, keep in mind that for today is radio access and core, it'll be broadly merged. It'll be seamless in terms of uh, uh, microservice-based uh, architectural, architectural uh, uh, concept. Great. I, I have a beautiful question previous that has been said, but it's a, it's a question from the audience without a name, but it's a good question because it says if 6G delivers uh, one terabit per second, we lack a sustainable wide area technology for it. And it needs new attention from the EU. And it says Huawei is proposing new IP. The United States is stuck with IP, which is coming to end of its life cycle. And how will the, the European Union address it? So a question on sustainable wide area technology. Does anyone care to take the floor on this one? Oh, the appetite is quite low, but oh, the Luis, please, it's yours. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm going to be adventurous here. Um, I, I think there are there are already studies going on with regards to, to IP, but also non IP uh, connectivity. So so uh, again, I, th I think that's something that's that's at least in, in very early stages and where uh, uh, not not only Europe, I think this is this is a collective approach and that's why I was I was insisting on on how important it is to to get our act together and and and, and be able to to get standards that work all across the world uh, this is already uh, starting to happen so uh, there are already uh, also people saying well IP, IP may be not the best for mobile connectivity uh, let, let's think of a new way and and thoughts are being already shared so that's that's as far as I can as I can provide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Volker. Oh, you were yeah. unmuting, sorry. No, uh, sure. What I can add, building on, uh, Louise, what you said is I, I think there's, so there's a technology debate ongoing and that's relevant and we have some ideas out of Nokia, but I think the more relevant part to this discussion really is about values and the values we stand for in Europe. So some of the concepts that are being discussed are, I think, implicitly assuming that we would need stronger like central control uh, for, for some of the IP networking. That's a discussion debate we need to help frame. And it's a debate that goes beyond technology really. And I think we need to make sure that whatever happens in the future is in line with the values we believe in, uh, you know, values of free speech and, and civil liberties. Um, as we enjoy today in Europe. That is a very good point. And I'd like to continue on that because there's another question that came in. Uh, it's, it's, it's exactly on this, with this one because 5G has become a, let's say, a battleground between others in the world. And um, compared to what I liked about your story, Luis, quite really, uh, just smallest and uh, Ali Botu said on, on manufacturing equipment, for example, and other great um, entrepreneurs that we have here, but also on standardization setting systems. Now, should we consider the possibilities, the question of a democratic alliance between US, Japan, I know there's people from Japan listening in, Australia, that's pushing stuff based on democratic value, or should it be a EU, EU sovereign effort? What is your take on this? Perhaps a question, Luis. Uh, from uh, let's see from the standardization model. Yeah, uh, you, you are you are coming across. Uh, I I hope you're hearing me okay. Yeah. Okay, because you were coming across a little bit uh, clipped. Uh, let let me see if I understood the question. Whether uh, whether this something we need to do around uh, uh, some kind of alliance or or imposing democratic values. I think. Um, Values is something that needs needs to come to 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 the, the development of technology, but uh, when it comes to standards, uh, we need to make sure 
that uh, we enable that these values can be enacted afterwards. So, uh, and, and then there's, there's a little, uh, let's say, conflict here, whether something that you enable will be properly used or not properly used. Uh, I, I, I put uh, examples, we were talking about privacy and, 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 and control. Uh, we, we've been having, uh, and, and we know that, that we need to enable that uh, our uh, judges and, and our, our, I mean, we have this lawful interception that can only be triggered through the courts. Now, uh, this is, you, you, you enable that in the standards? Then how do you implement it? Of course, in Europe, we are, we are very serious with that. And it's only a court that can say, well, yes, you, you need to, to, to intervene here. Um, whether this, this will be uh, used in a different manner, that's, that's very difficult to, to, to trigger from, from the technology perspective. So here, here definitely, we, we need to put these values in the way in which we develop the technology, but then we need to be very careful at, as how we deploy and, and, and put in place all this technology. And, and this applies to, to many other things, the way I say it, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else on this issue, Khalil? Yes, I, I come in. Thanks, Vlad. Uh, I, I totally agree with Lewis on, on the, uh, what he said. Um, you know, th there is a way of, uh, uh, and there are many facets of the technology development where values come in and we need to make sure that uh, the technology follows that. And uh, just to say that, uh, you know, our, our, the way we see the digital transformation in our economy and society is uh, uh, a transformation that uh, reinforces our democratic values, that re reinforces our fundamental rights. And I don't like, uh, you know, preserves. It's not preserved, it should reinforce it uh, the, for, for the future. It's a key, a key feature of the EU approach to the digital transformation. And therefore, uh, the EU has shown that uh, we are a reliable partner for those who would like to adhere to these values, but also for those who would like to work uh, with, with a level playing field with us worldwide without over preaching or whatever. It's that we, uh, we, we respect our partners and we have shown that it's the case. When it comes even to technology development, when it comes to cooperation and R&D, we have this uh, around the world and we will maintain that line. I think it's, it's part of also of our values to be a trusted partner but we also, were, we also want to be a strong partner as well. I think no one would respect a weak partner. We want to be a strong partner that, that brings in to this cooperation as we did before uh, uh, our, our uh, industrial strength, our knowledge, uh, the high education levels of, us, of our citizens. They have to be part of what we, what we bring in in this partnership. Now, the, the, uh, of course, I mean, if you look around the world where, where we have a good partnership now with like-minded economies to, to a large extent, but uh, it should not be, you know, just to exclusion of uh, 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 links or relations that we could have with the rest of the world. And that's, uh, that's the way we see it. Uh, the, uh, 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 we have very good cooperation with Japan. We have very good cooperation with the US. And I hope that this will continue in the future, but we have also cooperation with others worldwide. Uh, the, uh, uh, the sustainability of supply chain of like-minded economy is a very important aspect that we need to look at indeed. Thank you very much. Anyone else on this subject? Otherwise, we will be proceeding to a next question coming from the audience from Nicola, Nicolas. And the question is on regular regulation. Um, the question is, do you believe uh, we have to further adjust regulation to fully leverage the capabilities and potential of 6G? And he's especially thinking on the EU's regulation for an open internet. And that regulation might be uh, not, not that beneficial for the, for, the, for the rollout of 6G in Europe. And how do we see that? Is there anyone wanting to comment on this? And regulation in general or the open internet regulation? Uh, Ari here, if I may. Yeah, sure. 
Professor Parker. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned already earlier, uh, regulatory and legislative uh, barriers exist. And uh, I, me coming from a wireless background, obviously one of the things that we are looking for and what we are uh, uh, challenging in is this uh, auction-based, uh, uh, let's say, licensing of the spectrum in, in that has happened up to 4G and mostly even with 5G. We do see some light at the end of the tunnel because in some countries uh, like Germany, for instance, Japan, a couple of others who have chosen to at least partially release part of the spectrum for sharing based access. And this actually opens up the local, local markets for these new vertical private networks to be deployed in very efficient manner. And uh, obviously this is something that needs to be, if not the, the mainstream in the future, but at least it needs to be included into the frequency regulation throughout Europe, throughout the global world, so that uh, the, the, the sharing based access can be part of the regulatory process so that uh, different players can enter the market and not just the existing ones. This is great. Thank you very much. Um, looking at the time, we are uh, working towards the end of this webinar. Um, what I'd like to do is give all participants uh, the, the last minute of uh, the time to make a final remark. What is your conclusion on this webinar and what would you like the European Commission and the European Parliament to, to, to command with. So it's very important for us that you give um, your basic message to, the, to us and to the world on how to proceed on this important matter. And uh, let me just start. Are there any volunteers to start with? <laughs> can, I, can I start with you, Deputy Director General Khalil Rahana? Thank you very much, and uh, really many thanks for our two MEPs, uh, for Bart and uh, 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 to, to organize this and to co uh, coordinate uh, uh, the, the, the debate. Um, I think the, the, the move to 6G will be essential. The digital infrastructure is not uh, you know, a nice to have thing, and having the latest and best digital infrastructure is not you know, a nice to have uh, issue. It's a must for Europe, for our economies, for our societies, what the pandemic has shown us. And it's an enabler for innovation, for industrial development, but also uh, for, and for economic growth. But it's also an essential for bringing the latest services to our citizens as we see. So we have to be vigilant and make sure that we have the right instruments in place, adaptation of regulatory framework, but work also in partnership with the all stakeholders, uh, industry, academia, and of course, with the member states together uh, uh, for a, a, a common uh, vision and also a common roadmap to make sure that we, do, uh, we are the first movers and we are also, we have the best framework for the development of this infrastructure for the future. That's the way Thanks. we see it, and I'll stop there. Thanks, the best and first movers. That's a great way to end. So, so thank you very much. Professor Smolders. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bart. <coughs> um, yeah, also for me, it was a very uh, interesting uh, webinar and discussion. So, you know, I, what I think is that uh, at the end of the day, I think Europe has a very strong starting position, you know, from a technology point of view. Um, but we have to deal with, uh, you know, with the fact that, that we are not a, a, a a, a top-down led um, um, uh, uh, Europe, huh? so uh, we have all kinds of scattered initiatives, uh, and we have to, of course, to compete with uh, you know with with other parts of the world that are more like a top-down structure. And uh, I'm a little bit worried about that. So to be honest, uh, you know the the initiative that I brought forward, where we really have a kind of European. Uh, living lab on, on 6G, for example, I think we really need to think also in, in those kind of uh, uh, terms. So that, that would be my point to make. Great point. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Volker Ziegler. Oh, please, please unmute yourself, uh, sir. Thank you, uh, Bart. 
So inspiring session indeed. I guess it, it all starts for Nokia, Nokia Bell Labs. It starts with, with a vision, uh, being courageous and bold at this time, connecting the worlds, expanding human possibilities. And as to your question, yes, indeed, it's about partnering. It's about collaborating. It's about new and agile ways. Maybe I'd like to formulate as an invitation to join work of this, of, of developing and, and reinvigor reinvigorating the policy framework but I, I think the one uh, ambition we do have is indeed to lead, lead 6G out of Europe in the right way, in a collaborative fashion, and thereby truly creating value for society and mankind, not just in Europe, but worldwide. Thank you, especially reinvigorating the policy framework is something that we will be working on. Then, uh, Luis Jorge Romero, to you, the floor. Very much. Well, to me, to me it's, 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 uh, I would like uh, the Commission, the Parliament, to, to get really uh, the importance, the strategic importance of the standards, it's beyond writing technical specifications. It's a very important strategic uh, domain and uh, Europe has, a, I think, a, a very good and solid uh, grounds in which to leverage, so trust the system and keep on helping the system. Thank you. Great, I think that we fully recognize what you said. Um, Professor Pautu, Ari Pautu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this uh, webinar. It's been uh, very, very interesting indeed. Um, how I would start is that for us as, a, as, a, as a stakeholders in, in developing 6G, I would like to start this, this time the story from the, the different business areas, the verticals. and. Uh, we need to extract not just the requirements that would be set for future system from these vertical actors, but also the, the, what is the regulatory and legislative uh, landscape in those uh, areas and see what are the roadblocks currently there. Those need to be identified and then given the identification of these, we need to break the barriers in legal domain and regulatory domain so that we can bring in the solution with uh, at least some ease into these different areas since it seems that the ICT's technologies are the enablers and the productivity is the key thing and therefore we need to first look at what is attainable and then develop the technologies there. And the third, second thing related to the verticals is that their requirements are hugely different and therefore, it may also affect what Louis said here about the standardization. How do we standardize 6G if we start to have tens of different verticals and uh, have tens of different sets of requirements? And this actually then translates into what Walker said for about this AI-based air interfaces, which would then adapt itself to whatever requirement is there. So this also, all of these bringing new elements into standardization. And then obviously I was really glad to hear that the SNS is going through funding for 5G, beyond 5G and 6G research is there. And even more so pleased to hear that the recovery funds are in a big amount going to be used for digitalization of the society. And uh, hopefully that boosts also these productivity and, uh, and uh, other issues with sustainable fashion. So Thank you very much. From, Thank you very much from Finland, Professor Pautu. And I think yeah. it's true what you said, 135 billion for digital recovery is just great. It puts us in pole position, not just on the uh, RRF, but also on standards, also on manufacturing equipment, also on the some of the uh, edges that we already have. And I'm very pleased. Uh, that we are in this position now we have to make and great work. thanks to the parliament great thanks to the parliament really for you know support in this really <laughs> great and we will be supporting you and make sure we are the best and we are the first movers now i'd like to give the floor to my honorable colleague mauri pekarinen um and uh, to make some concluding remarks and i before uh, i do that i'd like to thank all the participants and all the speakers because this has been great but mauri the floor is yours please Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Uh, and I want to thank all of this excellent speaker for this excellent, uh, your excellent presentations. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, for all uh, participants all around in the EU. 
And uh, I can guarantee, I'm actually very sure that this uh, webinar has enhanced in our awareness of C 6C technology in European Parliament. I, I, I really believe that we can take some uh, very important indications. Uh, uh, and for instance, when we enhance our horizon programs, uh, those all three pillars, I think that the many issues which we had here in our webinar, I can, I am sure that we can remember this all. And I would like to thank you all for, for this webinar. And Bart, you are excellent. You are excellent moderator. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Also, thank you and bye bye. Enjoy the day wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for listening in and see you next time. Bye. Thank you.